Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 408, featuring the Silver Age of the computer role-playing game. I know by Silver Age, I'm talking about moving from that Bronze Age, where we're, uh, the developers were just starting to get their feet wet, commercially speaking. A little uh, market was slowly growing around the earliest uh, home computers. Uh, we're moving from that era into what I call the Silver Age, uh, which is the uh, first games, I think, that really hold up well today that... A lot of people still enjoy playing these games, and not just because of nostalgia or because they're uh, historians, uh, but they just really like uh, these games. They still play them. Uh, they're still uh, very relevant, I think, to the uh, CRPG scene. And now I've covered a lot of the Silver Age games. Uh, they've got their own episodes, and I'll uh, make a list of those at the end of the video. Uh, but in this video, I want to focus in on uh, the first three Ultimas, the original Ultima trilogy. We'll also take a look at Escape uh, from Mount Drash. Uh, one of the controversial games uh, with the Ultima label on it. Anyway, we've got a lot to cover, so without further ado, here is the Silver Age of CRPGs. And here we go, folks, with the granddaddy of computer role-playing games. It is Ultima. <laughs> Lord British Richard Garriott, the game that really launched his career. It's not his first game. We talked about a Calabath uh, last time. A lot of the stuff from Akelabeth gets rolled into this game. Uh, but it's much more ambitious. It uh, began this huge series uh, for him, the Ultima. Uh, I guess you could consider Akelabeth the uh, Zero. Sometimes people call that Ultima Zero. But <laughs> anyway, uh, to me, this is the game that really gets it all started. And as you can see there, this is 1981, and this is the original California Pacific release. It's uh, a lot more primitive looking than the later one they did. And I'll show you that later one from Origin, once he got his own publishing house. Uh, this one's still in the Ziploc bag, and <laughs> man, what a collectible that would be. So I bet one of you guys probably has the, I know, uh, I'm know, sure Lord British probably has a closet full of them. He's a big archivist, big collector. He likes to collect his own stuff. Uh, you know, he's probably got some, but man, I, I've never come across this in the wild. Uh, for sure, and if I did, I would snatch it up instantly. Um, but anyway, let's just look here at the game, and uh, we'll be looking today at Ultima, Ultima 2, Ultima 3, various versions of it, and really just having some fun with these games. You know, I think the big difference for me between the Bronze Age and the Silver Age, I mean, here we're getting into games that have held up. Uh, they're still played today. People still like to play this original Ultima game. Uh, you don't have to be a historian or some guy with total nostalgia <laughs> to, uh, to find this appealing. And I actually think the first one has some advantages over the later games uh, because it is so straightforward to get started here. Just quickly roll that character. You know, it's nothing like space. <laughs> that endless character uh, creation sequence. I mean, this you're up and running in no time. And the movement, everything uh, makes a lot of sense. There's a lot of keyboard commands. I see there's my first battle evil ranger. So it's just only one ranger. That's a relief. And I'm just armed with my dagger at this point. Trying to, get, I need to get over there to that town and get some better weapons and armor, but <laughs> uh, you get a lot of experience. 46 just for that uh, one battle. I'm wanting to say you have to get maybe 100 experience to get something. I don't know, I usually don't get that far along <laughs> before I'm dead. <laughs> uh, and there's the little town here of Fawn. You see the cute little character there. Just uh, wandering around. Looks kind of like a wandering tombstone to me. A wandering grave. <laughs> a little cross. <laughs> uh, but I need to stock up on some food, get some rations here. What was this little bakery? And all throughout this game, even at this point, you can find lots of Lord British's humor in here. There's a lot of characters. Of course, you'd want to read the manual to learn more, but there's quite a bit in the game. Just little touches. You know, somebody else be singing a song or t telling a little joke or something. Uh, so that's all in here. There's a lot of character, a lot of personality uh, to this. Let's see. Let me see what I can buy. Naughty No Man's Weapons Unlimited. <laughs> Naughty No Man. Naughty No Man's Weapons Unlimited. Uh, so naughty. Let's pick up a mace. Rope and spikes. That's kind of an interesting weapon. 
And of course, I ready the weapon. And let's see, I probably don't have enough gold to upgrade my armor. Now you see up above me there is a trans. Uh, that's where you can undergo an operation. Not satisfied with your the gender you select. <laughs> just, just kidding. That's uh, uh, you can buy a horse actually uh, from that right around in style. Okay, let's see. Got my uh, Iola the Bard. He yo ya he hum. Yeah, these characters, of course. I don't know how much you know about Ultima, uh, the, the story behind this. You really should watch. I've done some interviews with Richard Garriott. Uh, you can watch those. But, I mean, he's, he's done quite a few interviews. He's uh, got a couple of books. I don't know if he's he's written any yet. Uh, I think like he was working on one. Uh, of course, you got Shea Adams, Ult Ultimate. What is it? The Ultimate Book of Ultima. And then, I think, what, Dungeons and Dreamers and Hackers. You know, he's, he's mentioned in those books, described, interviewed. Uh, so he's, he's a pretty well-known figure. And I'll say something else about him. You know, every time he's ever come up in a conversation with other, other developers, other people that know him or knew him, they, they, nobody ever has anything bad to say about the guy. You know, they just really like him. <laughs> Apparently he was really fun to work for, really good boss, really nice, uh, honest, honorable man. It seems to be the consensus, and uh, you know I like that. I, uh, you feel like he's the kind of guy that had good values, right? And he tried to pass those along in his in his games. So let's see, there's a th three thieves. Now he's not the best speller. <laughs> the two thieves. At least he got the I and the E in the right place. But you could, you could just be wandering around, just kind of minding your own business. Next thing you know, you're being attacked by three or four things. Uh, combat, really, yeah, fairly simple here. I just hit the A button to attack. Now, I notice one thing. If you just don't move, you just sort of stand around, time passes. And I guess eventually something will come along and kill you. So I don't know if that qualifies this game as real time. I don't know if you could say it was real time or not because of that, but uh, yeah, well, that's a pretty tough battle there. What if this is a bear? Well, there we go. Plus 16 gold. So I'm getting enough gold there. I might be able to upgrade my armor here pretty soon. Yeah, just kind of uh, you want to wander around, explore, make a map. That's what these uh, games are all about, and if you die, <laughs> uh, no big deal. You know, it's you're really lucky if you last long, last a long time. Now, I think that yeah, there's the castle. I'm used to looking at the uh, 1986 version, so it's a little bit different. Uh, but yeah, that's the castle of Lord British. So let's go meet the guy. Huh? Let's go introduce ourselves. It's a great castle. It's got a nice little garden there, like a fountain. You know, a lot of people say, well, these, you know, the graphics back then were so primitive, they're so crude, so simple, yada yada. But, you know, part of me actually kind of like the, uh, this style, because you can really use your imagination here. Kind of like reading. You, know, you kind of have to imagine. They're just describing this, this castle. You have a picture in your mind. That's sort of what, what it looks like in your your mind, right? Your uh, your imagination. I love that. I think there's a little jester there. <laughs> I don't think you can talk to just anybody in this one. You can talk to the king. Uh, do you offer gold or service? Now, the, you offer him gold, then you can get some hit, hit points. And I think that's about the... Uh, I got some hit points from him. You can buy them. And I'm wanting to say it gives you hit points when you leave. If you, if you actually survive in a dungeon and make it out. I think it gives you some, some hit points uh, for that. But uh, You definitely want to make a note of coming to him and buying uh, health points because you definitely run out of them soon. Let's see. Guino the Jester. I've got the key. He's singing a song, that lovely song, I've got the key. <laughs> I've got the key. Wonderful song, that, that Guino. Really uh, top of the charts there. <laughs> anyway, I think I lost track of what I was saying earlier, but uh, one of the things he would like, he loved to do, Richard 
Garrett, he loved to do this. He would, he was going to Renaissance festivals. He loved those uh, Ren fairs. He loved Halloween. He loved uh, playing role-playing games, Dungeons and Dragons, you name it. Uh, but he would put his friends into those games, right? He'd disguise them. Uh, so one of the ones that you'll notice here is Chuckles, the jester, Chuckles the Clown. Of course, that is a uh, that's Chuck Bush. Did I get this last name right? It's been a while. <laughs> this is like B U E C H E. Uh, I actually interviewed the guy. I can't believe I can't remember how to pronounce his name. Uh, but anyway, he is in here, and I think the other ones too are people that he knows. Like uh, there's Iola, uh, several people. I'm not sure if they're all based on people that he role played with, but wouldn't surprise me. So I think that's that's pretty pretty cool, right? I'd love to know. Uh, to be his friend and find yourself uh, in the game. You know, that's something I, that's, I've always aspired to. <laughs> so far, nobody has done it yet. I've had a few uh, indie developers, and, and they'll say that they'll put me in the game somewhere. Maybe they'll have a rat <laughs> named after me. <laughs> and I think that'd be pretty uh, pretty awesome. But if you were friends with Richard back in the day, you could show up in Ultima and become part of the history. You know, and how cool would that a bit. Uh, so these are some hidden archers now. I'm saying I'm out of weapon range. Now one of the things I notice I get into the habit of pushing A a bunch of times real quick. Uh, you don't want to do that. You, you need to <laughs> be a little bit more uh, disciplined because uh, otherwise you can just keep attacking and just leaving if the monsters moved on. But, you know, hey, you get excited, it's Ultima, yeah, you get attacked, uh, <laughs> you know. <laughs> now, there's a, yet another little town. Uh, I'm not going to go in there. I want to go inside this dungeon here and then switch over to the, uh, the remake of it so you can see what the improvements were. I don't know if you saw, could see that. There's a little dungeon entrance there, the Dungeon of Mondor. All right, so one of the cool things about this game is you got this overland view with the tile-based graphics, but you can go into these dungeons, and there we go. This is pretty much uh, a Kelebeth style. Kind of reminds me of Wizardry 2, the, uh, the wireframe dungeons. So it really makes this world feel massive, right? You're wandering around overland, and then you can go inside these dungeons. It's, it's really probably more accurate to say these are two different CRPGs in one. Because uh, obviously this feels uh, incredibly different than that overland component. I mean, here we have the, the traps, and you can see the monsters in a first-person perspective. Uh, please wait. Now, it's kind of crummy on this Apple II Plus. I don't know if the Apple IIe probably would run run this faster. And again, I'm obviously I'm running these in an emulator. I'm not trying to hide that <laughs> by any means. So you, I kind of had to factor that in. There's a fudge factor here. I don't know how accurate this thing is in terms of speed. Oh, there we go. <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> oh, we got a giant rat. Got a giant rat. Oh, God. Man, I love these. And I got a mace. Perfect rat killing weapon. Get on that thing. With a mace. Gosh, God. <laughs> This is what it's all about. I mean, look at—he's begging for. He's got like these little claws that he's like, please hit me with the mace. But look, he's like an evil rat too. He's just those eyes, man. And he almost, he almost killed me. <laughs> got him down to nine health points, and there's a dad blasted thief after me. God, dog it. Matt's dead. All right. Anyway, let's flip on over to the '86 version. Hmm. All right, so moving on, then we've got the Origin Systems Incorporated, the the remake, and now I mean he's just gone all out with this. We've got twinkling stars. We've got <laughs> a little uh, teaser screen. Got a what is that? A, a eagle condor. And that's one of the things these early ones are known for. You load them up, you get a fun little movie, a fun little intro, and it really kind of sets the stage. Shows off uh, you know, that, that little bit of extra polish. Ultima 1. 
Well, I mean, he just really went all out. <laughs> I got the sword coming out of the, the lake there. It's a good system for government. Was it? How's that go? The strange ladies lying around in ponds, <laughs> distributing swords. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good system. You almost feel like he's just showing off. I mean, at this point, we've got the, the transitions, the fading out, the animation. It must have been mind-blowing back in the day. Okay, anyway, let's get her started. You always have this system with the player disc, the character disc, I think they call it. I always get those confused. But it really stuck. It really, really sucked back in the day if you accidentally recorded over your, your game disc. And I'm sure that probably happened to some people. I don't know if there's a system in here to prevent that, try to catch that from happening. Anyway, we've got our points to distribute, and you can just put them in there. You don't have to worry about rolling, trying to get it uh, just right. And I don't know really what the perfect stats are here. You know, I'm not a I, I generally don't play like that unless it's just the game. It's so hard that you have to. I guess maybe that's why I don't last too long. Maybe I should uh, do my research and figure out, like, what should you actually uh, prioritize there. Humans, Elf, Dwarfs, and the Bobbits. And ladies and gentlemen, the Bobbits has... <laughs> Any resemblances from to the Hobbits is purely... Purely coincidental. I don't know, you got me a dwarf male fighter. You know, there's not too many problems in life that can't be solved by a dwarf male fighter. Any real problems, that is. Oh, from darkest dungeons to deepest space. I mean, I even forgot to mention this. There's a whole space, uh, space dimension to this. Space uh, mode. Outer space, sci-fi. <laughs> I never got, never got uh, that far into this. You know, if you're really curious, uh, I think I mentioned him a couple times, but a CRPG addict. It's a good resource for you. He's, uh, I think he's actually gone all the way through most of these games. He's probably played a lot more CRPGs than I have at this point, especially uh, in terms of actually playing all the way through them. Uh, usually, if it's a game I didn't grow up playing, I just play it enough to kind of get my feet wet. Uh, but he actually plays all the way through and completes them, and he's got these really nice journals, or blogs, I guess, where you can read about his adventures. I mean, it's just a really good good side. I highly recommend that. Uh, CRPG Addict. Uh, here, I mean, you can see this This part looks, to me, I think this is just about identical looking. You know, obviously we have a nicer looking interface there with those uh, sort of windowed frames or whatever, whatever you want to call that. Uh, but otherwise it's uh, looks very similar. I think it actually probably is identical uh, to that other system. You know, the reason I'm pausing every now and then, I'm looking at the manuals here trying to figure out the commands. Uh, just about every letter here <clears throat> on the keyboard does something. Like K for climb or T for uh, transact. It's not talk, <laughs> it's transact. And you got all kinds of other keys you have to keep up with. Uh, I guess back in the day, you probably would have wanted to have this, this manual handy, along with your notes. Uh, let's see, what, where's my guy? There he is. <laughs> uh, there's Guino the Jester again, singing that classic hit, I've got the key. Man, I just can't get enough of that, that, that song. Dust thou off of pits. Go forth and find the grave of the lost soul, and don't return until this quest is completed. Get out ya here. Go find that grave. It's probably at the, in a dungeon somewhere, how much you want to bet. I probably will not be completing that quest. <laughs> Probably will, will die long before. Matter of fact, I might get lost on my way out of the uh, the castle here. Yeah, so yeah, I was uh, just kind of fooling around here. It says weaponry, armor, food. It looks like you should be able to buy stuff, but uh, I think you can only do that in the town. It's a tease, just a tease.
Nope, you can't just hit X <laughs> to exit. You gotta go out. Uh, some things never change. And here we go, the city of Britain again. Uh, so I'm not gonna play much more of this. I just wanted you to see uh, sort of the differences in the in the look of it. Uh, let me skip forward a little bit here, and you can see what the combat is like. All right, so there we have a. What is that guy? Some kind of wizard? A warlock! Oh, wow, this is not, not looking good. <laughs> but we, you can do a ranged attack. Or he can. I, I just have a mace. A rusty mace. Killed the wandering warlock. Now notice this. With this one, it was always just individual monsters. It'd be like just one rat or one warlock. I didn't have the three or the four. So I don't know if that's true throughout the game or not, but... Uh, I was I thought maybe I could get over the mountains with that rope spikes but there we go that was just for uh, <clears throat> it's just a better weapon I guess it doesn't really help you for some you know for some reason I keep thinking you can buy something to get over these mountains some kind of mountain climbing kit but <laughs> I might just be totally making that up uh, there's a nice bat so you see the dungeons look a lot similar. It seems to be moving a lot faster, though. Now, thou dost find nine copper. You notice that the name of this dungeon was Mount Drash. Now, if you're really an Ultima... Oh, there we go. <laughs> that, I think that's pretty much the exact same rat. And there's a, a bat. <clears throat> it's good to think that he didn't try to change what was working. Oh, look, there's a coffin. And this is a little bit creepy, right? Just finding a coffin lying in the middle of a, of a dungeon. But anyway, what I was saying is that the, the rarest of the rare Ultimas is that Mount Drash game. I think that's only released for the VIC-20. And they didn't get... That was uh, after this had gone to Sierra. And they didn't get uh, Garriott's blessing on that. I think he was actually quite, quite pissed about it. Of course... Being Richard Garriott, he's not going to uh, <coughs> <well. laughs> attack all over the place. Yeah. He just kind of went his own way after that. But uh, yeah, if you can track down that Mount Drash game, then you're playing something that's really rare. All right, I think we get the idea. I'm ready to move on now to the second game, Ultima 2. And here we go with Apple II, uh, the uh, second Ultima. Revenge of the Enchantress. The Revenge of the Enchantress. And this is the origin one. It's not the Sierra one. I just decided to go straight to this one. I actually like this one better. I think most people do that play these. Uh, we will take a look at some of the other versions. I want to take a look at the uh, some of the Commodore 64 stuff. Maybe the NES versions are kind of fun. Look at that. Whoa! <laughs> I mean, the detail, though. It's, you know, the eyes closed, the little two there is kind of sparkling. Nice look at those fonts. You can really tell he went all out. Yes, he said the original there was 1982. Uh, anyway, a lot of it is very similar to the uh, <clears throat> previous game, the first Ultima. One of the things I talked about in the book was a lot of the reviews, contemporary reviews of this game. Uh, they weren't pleased with this one. They kind of felt it was a rush job. Of course, that was talking about that 1982 version. I'm sure he would have... At least I hope he uh, patched the worst of those bugs for this 1986 re-release. Pretty sure he did. I don't really hear people complaining about that anymore. Uh, they do say that this... You know, this game doesn't seem to be many people's uh, favorites among the Ultima fans. It's kind of one of those in-between games. I kind of find it, uh, found it kind of annoying, to be honest with you. This, uh, <laughs> I don't know if it was all this water rustling. <laughs> kind of maybe a uh, dizzy after a while, sort of hallucinate. But uh, anyway, uh, this, this one has the, these time gates that appear, and you have to... Uh, It'll take you to a different time zone, a different period of time. 
Now this one is known for being the first Ultima with a cloth map. So if you're into cloth maps, this is the one you want to find uh, in a complete box set. You know, that story's been told a bunch of times, so won't get into that here. What am I fighting there? Now you see, with this one, I have to declare the direction I'm attacking. So you have to say specifically attack east. There we go, got took care of him. But yeah, just, for some reason I was having a hard time finding stuff in this one. All these time zones. <laughs> you know, it's kind of funny when you go to McDonald's. I think this is the only... Is this the only ultimate where you can go to McDonald's? <laughs> I don't know. There we go, going okay. Well, let's see if we can do something before we go. I mean, at this point, it's feeling a whole lot like the original game. Of course, this one has a uh, a different story and all that. But you know, if you're like me playing these, you just wanted to, to go around fighting stuff. There's definitely no shortage of that here. I <laughs> just cannot seem to hit anything. Okay, there we go. Finally took care of that. Yeah, no, no, I guess I have to have a boat to get across there. What is that? The, is that the Loch Ness Monster down there? <laughs> that little Nessie? Oh, that's cool. I don't want to kill that thing. This is why they're so rare nowadays, you know. All these avatars going around killing uh, Loch Ness Monsters. So just a few little background notes on this game. It did have a double the tile set of the original, and it moved a lot faster. Uh, so those were pluses. On the negative side, though, uh, when he did this game, he had a Sierra publish it, and they uh, tried to screw him over, at least according to him, or in his opinion, it seems like, uh, with the IBM PC version. Uh, so that... IBM PC wasn't a big deal when this game first came out, but of course it <laughs> got to be huge, and it didn't. Uh, he didn't have very good royalty arrangement because he didn't. I guess he didn't uh, know it was going to be such a big, a big uh, platform. Uh, so they say that's probably why he. Uh, that's why he uh, decided to go his own route with or, uh, his own publishing company. I, I tend to think that maybe there was something like that there. Uh, but I kind of, just from talking to him and getting to know him a little bit, I think he kind of always wanted to have his own publishing company because he wanted to have complete control over every uh, part of it, not just the game itself, but the stuff that came with it, the box, you know, all that. And having his own company, of course, he could call the, the shots, <laughs> not to mention keep more of the uh, the profits instead of having to just take a small royalty. You know, it worked out pretty well for him. Anyway, it just doesn't seem like this game has held up as well. Uh, as some of the other Ultimas, I think I might have mentioned that, the uh, reviews back in the day were kind of uh, lackluster. And I noticed even today, as on some of the Ultima community uh, hubs for the Ultima series, a lot of people were kind of trashing this one, saying just don't even bother. <laughs> skip, uh, skip directly to the third game. I mean, let, you read, let me read you what uh, CRPG Addict uh, had to say about this. <laughs> he says... Uh, I thought the first Ultima was a quaint little lark whose air cars and TIE fighters and jester side were, if occasionally silly, still part of his charm. Ultima 2, on the other hand, is a senseless travesty of a game that improves nothing on its predecessor and, in fact, makes things a great deal worse. <laughs> I see it goes on to kind of uh, take it apart. Uh, it's kind of sad, really. I don't even know if this bartender. He says, isn't this a great game? <laughs> I guess the answer for a lot of uh, Ultima fans is no. Uh, so anyway, there it is, Ultima 2. Uh, again, I, I never come across anybody that said this was their favorite one. So anyway, let us move on, though, because Ultima 3, I think, has a much better uh, reputation and is certainly a lot more fun, I think, and has, has held up a little better than the, the second one here. So anyway, let's move on to that one. So here we go with Exodus. Now, this is the game I think is probably the pinnacle 
of the Silver Age. I mean, just a really, really well done game. Great reviews, critical acclaim. People still love it today. Went on to influence uh, pretty much every JRPG uh, you've ever played. You know, you're, you're going to see that you know, here in a second. Just the way that it looks, the, uh, the idea of talking with all the NPCs. You know, there's a lot of influence here. Even this little fun... I love that little opening animation there. Just a lot of charm here. A lot to like about this game. Uh, from the depths of hell, he comes for vengeance. <laughs> yes. yes, he saw those negative reviews, and he's back <laughs> this time. He's not alone. Yeah, that's right. Uh, this is the cool thing about this one is apparently the Wizardry series was kind of kicking... I don't know if it was kicking ass, uh, kicking Ultima's ass, but he was doing really well. And uh, one of the things that people liked about it was you got to create your whole whole party instead of just one dude. And here we're going to create uh, four people. There's quite a lot of uh, quite a bit of variety here. And you'll notice uh, when you when we get into combat here, there's even a sort of a pool of radiance style uh, tactical combat screen. Uh, it's probably where they got the uh, the idea for that in Wizard's Crown. Uh, anyway, it's a really cool system. It's it's very hard. I didn't last too long, <laughs> uh, but it was uh, qu uh, you know quite a bit of fun with having four people in a party instead of just uh, the one. It does change up the dynamic quite a bit. Um, uh, so let's see. I'm looking on my Matt Chat page to see if I can find some Matt Chat uh, Matt Chatters to name my characters after. See if I can get the spelling right on this one. <laughs> Mizuku. <laughs> uh, so we'll see, guys. You, you never know if you're on, you're commenting on a video, you might end up one of the characters in the video. So. Some really awesome things about this game. I mean, he really went to town on the packaging, the materials. It's got all these manuals that came with it, the uh, three booklets. You got the Liturgy, Ancient Liturgy of Truth, the Book of Amber Runes, and the Book of Play. It's almost like, it's almost like a Dungeons and Dragons uh, game. You know, all those books that came with it. It's kind of a mini version of that. And another cool fact to it about this, it was the first Ultima game that had an official clue book. So a lot of people don't think so much about the clue books, but a lot of people uh, love the clue books. Uh, they'd get those and then help guide them through the game and help them actually to, to win the game uh, sometimes. I guess there's people out there that beat all these games with no help at all, but, man, they're, <laughs> they're better than me. <laughs> I would definitely want this uh, clue book, and it was written by... Uh, it's called Secrets of Caesarea, and it was actually written by his brother, uh, Robert. And I, I talk about it a little bit in my book, uh, Dungeons and Desktops, but there's a lot in this clue book... A lot of backstory, a lot of just fun stuff about the characters like um, Iolo, the Bard, some songs in there, some <laughs> just a, a lot of fun stuff. It's it's really worth uh, hunting out, and I guess if you're a real Ultima collector, you'll have that little book. It's 48 pages, and that got to be. I'm pretty sure all the other ones uh, after this had clue books, but you know before that you just had I guess that uh, uh, Shea Adams the ultimate book of Ultima. You know, so there were other books out there, but uh, this was a cash-in. I've actually heard, I don't remember if it was Infocom guys I was talking to, or the, some of the Sierra folks, but, you know, that was the uh, the adventure games, graphical adventure games and the text adventures with, with Infocom. But, uh, somebody told me that they were really in the clue book business. <laughs> uh, the the helpline business. Uh, they actually made more money with their helplines and their uh, clue book sales. Uh, walkthroughs or whatever. Invisi Clues, I think, was Infocoms. Not, I don't, did Sierra's? I'm not sure what they called theirs. But anyway, apparently they made more money with these uh, clue books than they <laughs> actually selling the game. You know, people just pirate the game, uh, but then they'd get stuck and they'd have to go buy the clue book. Is, you know, I guess one theory uh, for that. But uh, that's really cool. I love to have this. All sorts of little collectibles. You know, one day, maybe when I get... Uh, Rich and Famous on <laughs> my Matt Chat videos. <laughs> it's going to happen. It's going to go viral one day, and I'll just have, uh, you know, infinite gold at my disposal. I'm just going to buy, like, uh, all these collectibles and have them here to show you. Uh, but anyway, that would definitely be a cool one to have, The Secrets of Caesarea, uh, this booklet, clue book. 
Now you can see a lot of uh, stuff here. Uh, advantage, there we go, chuckles. <laughs> chuckles. <laughs> and so here we can talk to anybody and you can pick who it is you want it to, uh, to be the speaker for you. Oh, that's pretty cool. There's a LCB. Right, here's a little trivia for you. Do you know what the C stands for? It stands for uh, Cantabrigian. Cantabrigian. So it's Lord Cantabrigian British or Cantabrigian. Not sure how to pronounce it, but that's what the C stands for. So now you know. <laughs> There's Guino again. Moi, I, oya, o. Uh, so Lord British just says, welcome, uh, get some more experience. And so it seemed like I read somewhere where you have to have a hundred, it's it's on the hundreds, every hundred experience points you can come try to get a increase in your stats. And he'll only go up to level five, I think, and then after that you have to do something else. Enter if you dare. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to do that. Let's see if we can just kind of explore this chaos. So I don't know if you you probably picked up on this too. There's now that fog of war effect, so that the Phantom Fighter, the food sucks. Not here. Good day. <laughs> just wandering around the mess hall here, talking to people. Cookie cries. Like the food? Cookie. Anyway, what I was saying is that it's now got this fog of war effect, so that I'm only seeing what the you know people in this party could actually see. So I don't see the whole map of this town; just the uh, you know, the walls kind of obscure the, the view a little bit. So just little touches like that. You know, that's a pretty actually that's probably a pretty good, uh, pretty substantial improvement there. It makes it a lot more realistic, a lot more suspenseful, not knowing what's you know, around that wall in that other room. Of course, probably the biggest improvement or innovation, uh, I think it's the combat, but a lot of people talk about this, just the, the idea of talking to all of the NPCs. And so you go around, they, they usually just have a little snippet of something, every now and then they'll give you a clue. And apparently it's very important to talk to everybody. Here's Dupree. Drink up! Yes, that's, <laughs> that's my kind of NPC right there. Exodus lies beyond the silver snake. And so if you're a good ultimate player, you're writing all this down, right? You're taking notes because you never know what, where the, when this information might be useful. Uh, but anyway, it, it made the game feel a little bit more realistic, I guess. Uh, gave the villages a little more character. And people just really, really liked that. <laughs> Leave my shop, you scum! <laughs> oh, wow. That's probably even harsher than that uh, Might and Magic uh, 6 game. You know when you don't buy anything and they yell at you? Wow, leave my shop, you scum! Now this does get a little bit cumbersome here with the... You have to try to remember what the letters are for these items. Or you can look it up in the manual, I guess. Uh, you have to equip everybody, then ready the weapons, and then <laughs> wear the armor. Uh, so it's quite a bit of clicking around to get all this, uh, get all this sorted. Uh, but... You know, again, I like the complexity. I really enjoy the uh, uh, what this brings to the combat. You know, it's a little bit of it more. It's a lot more to it than just hitting A <laughs> for attack and uh, maybe picking a direction. Uh, so anyway, let me. Uh, I'll just skip over. This is kind of boring watching me uh, buy stuff and put put stuff on. So we'll, we'll just skip ahead a little bit and we'll get into some combat. All right. So we're out and about. Let's see how long it takes to run into some ne'er do well. Right the, the lands of Caesarea. And there we go. <laughs> okay, so you see what's happening here? Uh, so that one character now is split up into my four characters. They all have uh, fun little icons there, like the guy with the sword. Now I equipped the uh, thief with the sling, so he can actually attack at range. And I can also have some spells I can cast. And you know, They don't give you a lot of magic points. Uh, to start off with anyway, but uh, you can try to heal your characters. Uh, you can, uh, let's see, I forget what the, <laughs> well, I try to remember what the, uh, what to type in to make it cast a spell. But you can see we got a little bit of uh, more tactics here. You know, how do you want to position your, your guys there? Do you want to gang up on one? Do you want everybody attacking? 
different mobs. And you want to try to scoot ahead so you can keep attacking at range. Uh, should you cast your spells now? Do you want to you know, conserve your mana points? I mean, a lot more uh, tactics get into it. And it's, it's not super complex. I mean, we just had this sort of one screen there of, uh, uh, with the, where the battle's taking place. But I just think this really adds to the game. I and mean, this, is to me, was a fundamental... It felt really different than just all the previous ones where you were just uh, the one character attacking and it goes a spell. <laughs> that was great. I think I just completely one-shotted that. Uh, what is this? Orcs? Uh, West Wind. Seven and seven. I wonder what those... I'm not sure what all these uh, stuff on the screen represents, but... I'm glad I picked up that sling, though. i tell you that. That sling is a really good weapon. I, I noticed uh, if you have a dagger, if you're not careful, you can accidentally throw your dagger, and then after that, you're just left with your hands. There we go. Experience. Point. What is that? Point negative 03? I'm not sure what's going on there. All right, now we just got this. This one ought to be easy enough to take you out. So you can, I can easily see why people preferred this game so much. I mean, you got lots of cool stuff in, in the combat. It really feels more like a tactical, like a, almost like a war game experience. And see, there's our chest. Got some some gold there. And I don't know about you. I know some people are kind of divided on this, but I always thought it was cool to have a, a party of adventures. That's a lot more party management to consider. You know, you have a whole party you have to equip and keep fed and <laughs> armor and, and magic points and, you know, positioning on the battlefield. I mean, it all just, to me, makes for a better game. <laughs> I think I'm about to get my butt kicked, though. I mean, there's only four of us, and there's got to... Oh, good Lord, what? How many of these things are there? I don't think I'm going to survive this. But anyway, it's pretty easy to see why people prefer this. And I'm not even getting into, like, the bigger story, you know. Uh, all of that jazz. I do want to show you what the dungeons uh, dungeons look like quickly, though. Uh, so let me skip over there and show you what, what that looks like, because they also look quite a bit better uh, than the previous game. All right, so again, just to show you what these dungeons uh, dungeons look like, I skipped over here to another save I had going. And I'm a little... It's really too early for me to be trying to get into a dungeon because I don't have enough... Uh, oh, <laughs> I don't have a light... <laughs> Uh, I don't have any torches, I just have to use the, the spell here. Uh, but you can get a look at, a quick look at what it would look like. So let me cast a, a light spell. You know, I, I kind of like this, uh, what, what's happening here, right? So I've forgotten, like, how to cast the, the spell, what, what, what it's called. So I'm, <laughs> you know, scrambling to look at the, look it up in the manual. Uh, the book of spells or whatever it is and you know meanwhile this game is just ticking on right it's just turns are passing uh, it's just you know going along so if i don't hurry up here <laughs> i could uh, be killed so that kind of adds a little bit of a drama that way a little bit of excitement let's see misty writing pretty in depths so you can see the uh, wireframe is gone we have uh, well that didn't last long <laughs> that, is, that is a joke of a light spell. Wow. I'm about to run out of points, too. So obviously I'm in here well before I should be. But uh, you can see that we have gotten rid of the wireframe. We have these uh, solid color dungeons. So it looks a little better, I guess, than the uh, wizardry at that point. I'm not going to make out like it's some huge, you know, unbelievable <laughs> improvement. But <laughs> uh, I, I do like it better than the wireframe. And then, of course, in, in combat, you know, this one doesn't stick to the first... You know, in those other ones, you go into a dungeon and the monsters are shown there. And like I said, first-person perspective. Uh, this that keeps up with the same game engine, or the same uh, combat engine. Uh, so that's kind of cool, I suppose. So it no, lo it no longer feels like two separate games, right? It just feels like the, you go into a dungeon. Slightly different exploration mode, which I think is appropriate for a dungeon. And you want that to feel a little bit more immersive than this overland view, but it keeps uh, the combat engine the same. Oh, so anyway, that's just a quick glance there at Ultima 3 on the uh, Apple II. I want to take a look at some of the other versions, uh, especially the uh, Nintendo one. 
because uh, they're quite a bit different than this, and I think they're different in interesting ways. All right, so let's take a look at this Nintendo version of Ultima 3. This was the first Ultima uh, for consoles, but if memory serves, you can see they added a nice title screen there with some nice uh, soundtrack. I actually enjoyed the, the soundtrack. Now, I didn't personally have any friends that had this game for their Nintendos back in the day, but of course it's easy enough to find it today. Uh, some of the uh, reviews, they're, they're kind of mixed. I was looking at some, just, you know, just Googled uh, this game, NES reviews, and uh, they're kind of all over the place. I mean, here's this one guy, he's actually, uh, he was this, uh, Nintendocomplete.com. And this guy's actually saying he hates the, <laughs> calls the soundtrack rancid, hates uh, the look of these uh, characters, the anime style characters there, but. Uh, in other reviews, you can find uh, people actually praise the, those things. So I guess it's just a kind of uh, <laughs> subjective, uh, whether you love it or hate it. What I think is interesting about this game, though, is just how they've kind of... Uh, I guess what's the word? Localized the the, uh, the game, not just the... You know, I guess we're looking at a, a retranslation. It probably went to Japanese back to English for this. But you can definitely, it doesn't feel anything like uh, the Ultima 3 on the uh, Apple II. That's for sure. And it's not just the controls are different. It just feels like a different game. But I'm pretty sure they didn't change up like the layout of the towns. But one thing you've probably noticed is that I, when I'm moving around in town, you see all four of my guys instead of just the one. And same thing for the uh, Overland View. And so it's really, uh, you know, you'd have to be, you have to know a lot more about Ultima to be able to really get in there and talk about the differences, all the differences between the games. But uh, I just, I find this intriguing. It's, it's like sort of a reinterpretation, a reimagining uh, of the game for a different audience. Uh, let's uh, skip forward a little bit, and I'll show you the what the combat's like. Let's see, here we go with some skeletons. And it does preserve the uh, the tactical dimensions to this. I mean, this part feels uh, very similar. Of course, different artwork. And I don't think the <laughs> Apple II version had this music. So I think that's a nice addition. Let's see if we can cast a spell here in Cleric. Uh, do the Undead. Yeah, so look at that. That's a powerful spell. Just killing these uh, skeletons left and right. Now, one thing, I, I don't know if I, know, I mentioned this before, but... Uh, only the character that actually kills something gets the killing blow in, gets the experience. Uh, so that's something a lot of people talk about and how you have to kind of switch it up. You don't want to always have uh, the same character getting the death blows in because then they, they'll, they'll be the only ones to level up. And you kind of have to plan it out a little bit like that. Uh, like I said, though, all in all, I'm not really uh, super knowledgeable about this NES port. I don't know much else about it. You know, they... The soundtrack for this actually was apparently popular enough in Japan to warrant a uh, separate uh, release. I guess they put it out on CD and they had uh, lyrics and everything that went with it. I'll see if I can remember to post a, a link to that. It's, it's kind of fascinating. <laughs> a little bit, maybe a little bit unintentionally uh, humorous with the uh, questionable translations. Now let's, uh, in the tradition of ending with truly terrible games, let's take a look here at Ultima Escape from Mount Drash. Uh, this is a game that's, uh, I, I don't think hardly anybody had heard about this until a few years back. I guess it's been probably, uh, <laughs> might be a 10 or more years back uh, at this point, but uh, it went up on eBay. And I guess people had forgotten this thing ever existed, uh, for the most part. But it was uh, a, a spinoff of Ultima. And I thought, uh, like seemed like everybody else thought, that it was uh, done without Garriott's approval, and he got mad about it when he found out about it. Uh, but it seems like some more stuff has come to light since uh, I last looked into this. I'm reading over here at Digital Antiquarian. I guess they've dug up some more uh, information about this. So they say that the true story is uh, that Zabalao E, uh, Zabalao E, uh, he was a he had worked with Garrett before on some uh, programming. Uh, let's see. He was doing a simple maze running action game when he showed the finished product to uh, Sierra. They were doubtful. It wasn't terrible, but wasn't great either. 
And uh, by 1983, the Big 20 was basically uh, dying out. Uh, so let's see. They, um, uh, Sierra thought that marketing it as an Ultima game <laughs> might help with the sales. It says Garrett was not thrilled with Sierra at this point, but he's always good to his friends. Uh, when uh, Zabalao, he came to him with the request, Gary had agreed, probably as a personal favor. Uh, so there you go. Um, it says that uh, Gary was an Ultima, I guess at this point, were still very young. They didn't really have a lot of uh, concerns about, I guess, the power of branding. Uh, so there you go. That's uh, the true story according, according to the Digital Antiquarian, and I have no reason to doubt that. I actually like that story a little better, I think, than the uh, <laughs> Sierra uh, trying to pull a fast one on Gary. Uh, I still think it'd be a great prank to play on him, though, if you could ever find a copy of this to take it to a convention or something where uh, Lord British is speaking and see if he'll sign a, co <laughs> sign a copy of this for you. <laughs> I'd uh, love to be there when you, when you tried that one. All right, anyway, folks, I hope you had a, a good time uh, looking at these games. Uh, obviously, the Ultima series, there's tons of different versions for many, many different systems. Uh, there's the uh, originals, and then, of course, you have those uh, the trilogy remakes. And all kinds of people are doing all kinds of stuff now on, on modern machines, uh, resurrecting these games, remaking them, you, know, you name it. Uh, personally, I was not, uh, I didn't grow up with these. You know, I just kind of discovered Ultima later in life. So I'm probably nowhere nearly as knowledgeable as some of the people that will be in the comments here. Now, so I'm just going to ask them. I'd like to know what their thoughts are. Uh, you know, if you're an Ultima fan, what's your favorite? Do you like one through, you know, just out of these uh, first three games? Or maybe Mount Drash, you know. I'd like to know what, which one's your favorite and which system, uh, which version, which port do you like the best? Do you prefer the originals? Uh, or maybe the Amiga versions. I saw some people like those. Or the, I think GOG has the, the DOS versions. Uh, but I'd love to hear that and just maybe just your experiences uh, with this series. It's always fun to read about other people's uh, experiences. Anyway, I'll uh, stop it here, and uh, thanks for watching. That's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, hopefully we'll be back soon with the... I'm not sure yet if I'm going to do another Silver Age uh, installment or maybe I'll just jump right to the uh, Golden Age. I'm <laughs> really a big fan of the Golden Age. It's probably my favorite. Uh, so I'm kind of uh, eager to jump into those games. But you know I might do? There's enough games left. I think I could do another episode uh, around the Silver Age. If there's particular games you want me to, uh, to cover uh, in one of these uh, retrospective type videos, uh, just let me know. I'd be happy to consider it. Uh, as always, I want to thank you. Thank you very, very much for uh, all you've done to support me, support the show, to support Matt Chat, to uh, preserve video game history. I really, really appreciate it. You have no idea how much I appreciate your support with this show. If you uh, would like to support it financially, I certainly uh, would appreciate that uh, even more. Uh, just go to that link in the show notes to the Patreon site, uh, One Buck a Show. Hey, if you want to do two bucks, three bucks, uh, whatever uh, you're comfortable with, uh, whatever the show is worth to you, uh, whatever it is, I really appreciate your help. Also, I appreciate it when you uh, subscribe to the channel, uh, share the links with people, uh, mention and tweet about it, Facebook about it, whatever it is you do. Uh, as you know, I'm not supported by any uh, commercials here. There's no advertisers, uh, no uh, sponsors or anything like that. It's just people like you uh, who, who <laughs> like this stuff and I uh, want to keep these shows coming. So uh, thank you for that. I do want to mention that I'm running a a kind of a summer sale of my own, my own little uh, Steam sale. Uh, so you know, you probably have heard me talk about these uh, Matt Chat coins before. Uh, these are designed by uh, Robbie, a really talented, uh, fantastic artist. He's actually doing the cover of Dungeons and Desktops uh, 2.0 uh, for me. Uh, just amazing stuff. But he designed these uh, coins. And these are really high quality, heavy duty challenge coins. They come in their own. A uh, little velvety sack, a little, little treasure bag, a uh, 40-coin bag, coin pouch, whatever you want to call it. And uh, I think these are really, really fun. But uh, I originally had these set aside for people that had contributed more than $100 on Patreon. But, you know, honestly, I think, uh, you know, considering most people are on the buck a show uh, plan, you know, I probably won't even be making these by the time they get to 100 So 
Now what I decided to do instead is just uh, for a limited time sell these on eBay and they're right now they're $25 and then whatever the cost of uh, shipping is uh, to your country but you know I'll post a link to those in the show notes I'm not going to be running this for long because uh, uh, you know it takes some time to go to the post office and get all this stuff uh, in the mail you know it's a lot nicer when I can just send out a, a bunch of them all at once uh, so if you're interested in one of these coins uh, again, just go to that link in the show notes. You can pick one up, uh, $25. Uh, you'll be supporting the show that way, and you'll have a, a really cool physical item, a collectible, uh, that I think you'll really enjoy. And, you know, if you ever, if you ever run into me in a bar or something, you can challenge me uh, for drinks, and we'll see who has their challenge coins. So that uh, should be a lot of fun. All right, so what about that news from the Mad Cave? Oh, uh, quite a bit of news. Uh, some big, big stuff here. Uh, the first is that Hero U, and I know a lot of people wrote in about this uh, already, but Hero U, uh, Rogue to Redemption is out. That is, of course, uh, from Lori and Corey Cole, who I had on the show to talk about, if you remember that. That's, I think this game has been in development for like four, what, what, five years now, something like that. Kind of lost track of it. I know they seemed like they had to run another Kickstarter at some point. They kind of run into some trouble. And people were saying, hey, they're never going to release this game. This is just uh, going to be one of the, the many failed uh, Kickstarter projects. And, uh, the, you know, people were going on like that. It's, you know, those kind of, <laughs> they're, they're never hard to find, those people. Uh, but it's all baloney because the game is now out. Uh, you can pick it up on GOG, goodoldgames.com. It's 10% uh, off right now, and uh, it's about $31.50, I think, <laughs> $31.49. And if you haven't, if you didn't buy it on Kickstarter, uh, why don't you go to GOG, uh, use the link in the show notes. Don't forget to do that because I actually get a small little kickback uh, from GOG uh, if you buy it on there. It doesn't cost you anything extra, but it's, it's a good way to support the, the show. Uh, anyway, I played it a little bit. It's got, <laughs> man, it has a lot of puns in there. Uh, so if you hate puns, you're going to hate this. Uh, but if you like puns and you like killing uh, rats in cellars, and I mean, who doesn't like killing rats in cellars? I think you're really going to uh, enjoy this. Uh, so anyway, that's Hero U, Rogue to Redemption. I probably will do a review of that uh, at some point once I get through with my, uh, my book. And then Stig wrote in with a couple of items here. The first is uh, the... If you remember that series of games about the, called the Commandos or the Praetorians, Imperial Glory, a company called Calypso Media Group has bought up all the rights to those games, and they're saying that they already have some new games in development, and they're planning to, uh, I guess, remake some of the older ones or at least uh, update them somehow. So uh, exciting news for people that are fans of those series. And he also wrote in about this one. This one's kind of got, this really caught my eye uh, I'm sure a lot of you folks have probably played those old Lucasfilm uh, point-and-click uh, graphical adventure games. Uh, they're really fun, but this one is uh, Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis Special Edition Demo 2.0. Now this has been a, what they call a labor of love by a group of fans. Uh, to update this, it's a not, not a profit, for-profit uh, project, it's just for fun, just out of uh, love for the game. And the, the warning here is that you have to get this quick because they feel like a Lucasfilm and Disney. You know, they have sort of their uh, IP tentacles everywhere. And they're probably going to find this any day if they haven't already and uh, make them take it down. So if you're interested in this uh, uh, this uh, fan project, go ahead and grab it as soon as you can. I'll post a link to that in the show notes as well. All right, I think that will do it for the news. Oh, I did want to mention this. Uh, if you want more Silver Age stuff, you can look Matt Chat 29 is on Wizardry. I've got interviews here with uh, Robert Zerotek and Robert Woodhead, uh, various episodes with them. Uh, episode 40 is Sword of Fargo uh, with the author of that game. Uh, also, Episode 48, Dungeons of Daggeroth, and <laughs> Episode 57, Tunnels of Doom. You know, it's, it's always funny when I get somebody in the comments and they'll say, Matt, you know, when are you going to do an episode on X game? <laughs> like, I've already done the, an episode on that. So I think I need to do this more, right? Just you know, mention uh, some of these that are relevant. You might want to go back and watch. And I'll see if I can remember to put links to those. Anyway, I mean, what have we got? Like 300-something episodes at this point? Uh, 400! 
I mean, no wonder I can't remember all this stuff. So I definitely don't expect you to. Uh, but I, I will try to remember those at least. Uh, uh, so you can, <laughs> if you want more, you can easily find it. All right, what about that ale of the week? And I was looking for ales that might have something to do with Ultima or the Silver Age. About the closest I could get was this uh, uh, one from Hammerheart Brewing Company. I know I've had a couple of those, or at least one of those before. Uh, they got some of the best-looking labels I've ever seen on an ale. It's very Nordic. It looks like <laughs> they look like the covers of uh, some kind of black metal album. I mean, it's just really fantastic artwork. And, uh, of course, the beer is usually pretty good, but we'll try this one. I haven't tried this one before. It's called the Flaming Long Ship. Flaming Long Ship. Hey, there are ships in the Ultima games, right? The little sailing vessels. Uh, strong Scotch Ale. Uh, and this is kind of weird, I thought. So they... <laughs> they call it a strong Scotch ale, but it says here it's only 8.5% alcohol. Which, you know, that's fairly strong, but, uh, I mean, there's like 10, 12% uh, percent, uh, Scotch ales out there. I think I've even seen them as high as, like, um, I'm pretty sure I've seen a 15%. And of course, there's those, the, <laughs> what was that Bismarck one I had that was like 40%? And that's kind of crazy. But uh, anyway, that's not really all that strong. It says, a deeply malty scotch ale with a bit of beechwood smoke for depth. Oh, they do mention the artist here. It's uh, Hannah Larson of, of Softjaw Soft Jaw Design. Soft Jaw Design. That's right out of uh, Leno Lakes here uh, in Minnesota. I mean, wow. That's some really great artwork on this. Maybe I should see if I can get in touch with that, uh, that company. <laughs> see if I can get them to do some mat chat work for me. Because that's uh, really cool. Uh, very Viking uh, inspired. Anyway, let's uh, get this uh, flaming longship open. <laughs> That's a bit of a tongue twister. Let's get this flaming longship open and see what it's all about. All right, so we got some of this Hammer Heart flaming longship here in the uh, rather excellent and rather appropriate drinking room. I think the Hammer Heart uh, folks would approve of my uh, uh, glassware selection. I always think it's funny when the, you get a beer and it says, uh, you know, recommended a goblet, uh, recommended a wine glass, <laughs> recommended a brandy snifter. I'm like, uh, you know, take this. This is my uh, recommendation for any kind of alcoholic beverage whatsoever. And if it's not fit for this drinking horn, it's not fit for human consumption. Anyway, so I'm a little bit congested today, but I can certainly smell the that smokiness they were talking about. I think they was, said it was beechwood. Uh, you can definitely smell some uh, some smokiness there. It smells like kind of a cherry uh, aroma to it. There's a uh, something unusual in there. I can't quite place it. I don't think this is a sour ale. Uh, anyway, it smells all right. Uh, let's give it a taste, though. <laughs> Man, this is a, a super smoky. I mean, you definitely smell that smoky. Uh, you taste that smokiness uh, right away. It's a very sort of thick, a uh, little bit of a bitter, uh, sweet uh, finish on this. Let me let me try it again. So, actually, I don't know if you can hear this, but it's actually a very loud ale. You know, when I was pouring it, I could sort of hear this, <laughs> like a hissing coming from this. Uh, it looks like it settled down now, though. Uh, let me try it again. <coughs> yeah. <laughs> Ooh, this one uh, would definitely take some getting used to. It's a very, very dark. Um, it starts off really smoky and bitter. Uh, that goes away fairly quickly, and then you get kind of this sweet, sort of chocolatey, uh, coffee-like finish on it. There's a lot of cherry, a lot of bourbon flavors in there. Uh, it said scotch. Uh, yeah, that's that's pretty pronounced, but I, I think what happens, though, is that smokiness kind of uh, blows you over at first. It takes a while for those other flavors to uh, <laughs> to present themselves. Let me try it one more time here. Uh, you know, they did say it was very strong. Uh, I don't know if it's uh, you know, necessarily strong in alcohol, but the flavors on this are incredibly strong. Uh, you know, it's not really my cup of tea. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just so smoky and bitter. It's kind of hard to take. I guess if you wanted to be kind of macho, you could 
uh, get your friends together and do some flaming long shit. You know, see how tough you are. Uh, so, you know, I'm sure there'd be people out there that would absolutely love this. Not really so much uh, something I would want to drink, uh, <laughs> you know, on a regular basis. Uh, I guess I'll go maybe three out of five uh, on this. If you do like a really smoky flavor, I might go up, you know, four or five uh, drinking horns uh, on that, though. But, uh, <laughs> you know, what can I say? It just doesn't quite match my personal preferences. Uh, so I'll go three out of five on that. Uh, but certainly not bad. Uh, Flaming Lung Ship uh, by Hammerheart. All right, so let's wrap it up with a quote. I was looking uh, for quotations about perfectionism because I know uh, Lord British is... Uh, he has that reputation, right? He's always trying to outdo himself. He's so ambitious uh, with his projects. And I think it really, uh, he's such a nice guy, but I think it bothers him when things don't turn out quite the way uh, he wanted them to. At least that's kind of the impression I get. Uh, but I found a quote that I thought really uh, is uh, perfect for this episode. And it's, uh, it's about perfection. It's by Aristotle. It goes something like this. Pleasure in the job puts perfection in the work. So ponder on that and see you guys next time. To be quite frank, Kevin, the fabric of the universe is far from perfect. It was a bit of a botched job, you see. We only had seven days to make it.